Hey, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, so one more time, uh, my name is Adam. I, opa. I am a machine learning engineer from Solid CX, and today I will be taking you to the journey through quality dialogue embeddings. In our journey, we'll be working out a use case. Sorry, I have to fix the mic. This is not comfortable for me. OK, well, let's try like that. So we'll be working out a use case together for a non-existing airline company called Python Air. So Python Air is really cool, customer-centric. So then customers like George can reach out and be helped by chat. So in this part of the conversation, George introduces himself. He says he'd like to fly from Prague to London. He mentions the journey dates. And in the end of the conversation, the employee of Python Air, Ben, he will book a ticket for, for Ben. Ben can do four other actions apart from booking. He can also cancel the flight, change the flight, so there is no such flight, or so there is no such action. Now, because Python Air is a data-driven company, they would like to track automatically these actions. So essentially, they would like to build a predictive model that will be able to say what's the, what's the action that Ben has done given the conversation. And today we'll be having like a fuchsia problem where so Python Air provided just 10 labeled dialogues for each action. And then they throw us 15,000 dialogues for which we don't know the actions. We'll make use of that. And we agree that we'll be evaluating this predictive model with F1 score on some holdout evaluation set. Now, this problem can be translated into the following pipeline. So in the beginning, you have the conversation. Then you'll pass it to the transformer. You will get some representation of this conversation. So essentially, whenever in my slides you'll see these squared brackets and a floating point number, it's a vector. And these vectors, they are representations that point to the, to the meaning of the conversation. And I'll be using interchangeably the word embedding. So embedding is also representation, the same thing. So once we have that, these, these embeddings, we'll pass them to the logistic regression, and finally, we'll get our predictive outcome. Now, I'm deliberately choosing here like a simple classifier such as logistic regression to illustrate that all the interesting things are happening within the transform model that will be providing quality representation based on which we'll be doing the classification. So everything that we'll be doing from now on, we'll be tweaking this transform model to, good as, to give us quality representations. So how does this transformer model look like? So very briefly, I think you're familiar with it, but I think it's important to go through it. So we will pass a conversation to this transformer. Well, first, sorry, we'll concatenate conversation. So it's just one plain string. Then we will tokenize it. I think you're familiar with it. We will pass it through the transformer. So we'll extract token embeddings. So every single token will have their own representation. And finally, because we need just one vector, we need to do some, well, it's called pooling. Oh, pooling, so we will just take an average of all these vectors within our conversation, and then this will be the vector, this point four dot dot dot, that's the vector with which we will represent our conversation, and this is what we will be passing further to the logistic regression. Now, today, well, or today, to start with, uh, we'll be using MPNet. I'm not sure if you're familiar, if not, it's just a regular transformer encoder. If you're familiar, uh, if you're in interested in the details, have a look at the, the, the reference. So, uh, MPNet. Now, in code, I'll be showing, by the way, these like short snippets with sentence transformers. It's super simple to work everything I'm showing. Super simple, few lines of code. So essentially, we define a sentence transformer to consist of two modules. Transformer module, essentially we say we like the MPNet. We define the pooling, where we say that our dimension, dimensionality is, well, 768. And then we say in line A that we like to do the mean pooling. So we like to take the average of all these tokens in that conversation to represent our conversation. So finally, on the last line, we say model.encode, and then we will pass our conversation to get our embedding. Here I have an example where we will say, I want to fly to Prague. So if we call that, you'll get our embedding, our representation, which is the vector, as I said. And if you will have a well-behaved space, you could expect that similar things will be close together. So close to the sentence, I want to fly to Prague, there should be somewhere sentence, synonymous sentence, I would like to travel to Prague by plane. Yeah, these are synonymous. Cool, so we have our MPNet. Let's pass all the conversation through it. Let's extract the embeddings. Let's train logistic regression, run the evaluation, and ooh, we got an F1 score of 59%. On one hand, okay, not bad. On the other hand, uh, MPNet, 
It's a model that has 110 million parameters, and this is really not a complicated problem. So, well, something is not working here. What's that? Well, the problem is that the MPNet and generally transformer encoders, they are trained to represent these, these, these token embeddings, not the final one. So I'm here mask, um, mentioning the, the, langu the language modeling objective, which with the model was trained, probably you're familiar with BERT, so BERT was trained with mask language modeling, MPNet was trained with a little bit smarter objective, but still, MPNet was tree trained to represent these tokens, not this final sentence, in our case, dialogue embeddings. So to give you a little bit more intuition, let's work out these examples. Let's compute some cosine similarities. So here we have, you'll be always calculating cosine similarities with the reference to the sentence, I want to fly to Prague. So let's first calculate it with the synonymous sentence. We see it has very high cosine similarity. One is the max, so it's nearly perfect. So far, so good. Let's take some random sentence, but very true sentence. By the way, I'm a fan. Sparta Prague is the best. It has a lower cosine similarity as we could expect. Good. But if you will take an opposite sentence to our reference, I don't want to fly to Prague, that has a higher cosine similarity than the synonymous. So something is not working well. Yeah? So take this statement with a grain of salt. This is just an example. But like generally, transformer encoders, such as MPNet, they are not suitable for representing sentences. So what's suitable for representing sentences? I think I'm not going to surprise you when I say sentence transformers. So let's, what are those mysterious sentence transformers? Sentence transformers are, in fact, just fine-tuned regular transformer encoders that are pre-trained to provide you the, the, the right sentence representation. They don't focus on tokens anymore. They really focus on the last layer, on the sense embedding, on the embedding that we're looking for. So let's use them. In order to train them, there are many different ways. I think the most standard pattern is that they have, you have to provide to a certain transformer a pair or pairs of semantically related data. So for instance, here we have a pair. The first one is, I want to fly to Prague, and I would like to travel to Prague by plane. Yeah, and this green arrow, it represents the label. So we say these things, they are similar, yeah, pretty much. They're the same sentences. But we don't have to pass just similar or the same things. We can just pass to the transformer to train it like related things, like question and answer pairs, like what is the best club? Sparta Prague is the best. Yeah? So one is the answer to the other. They are semantically related. They, they are so thus they should be similar. Now, how to train a trans sentence transformer? Well, that really depends. Today, we'll be using sentence MPNet. By the way, the official name, it's all MPNet base we do, but Let's just stick to the simple version, sentence MPNet. Sentence MPNet is one of the best, very small sentence transformers, just for the record. And uh, how is it trained? So sentence transformer needs these pairs of semantically similar uh, text. So let's take it. Let's pass it, or it, let's pass it through the original MPNet that I, we just used a moment ago. And then sentence MPNet was trained with multiple negative symmetric ranking laws. It's quite a complicated name for a relatively simple thing, so what, what's happening? So in order to, to train the sentence MPNet, we will pass our, we'll take a batch of data. So let's take these two examples that we had. Let's create the embeddings. Uh, so let's create the embeddings and create a similar to matrix. So right now we're looking at a similar to matrix. And notice that on the diagonal, so from here and here, those are the pairs that we told the model to be the same. Yeah? So this green arrow, those are our labels. So, so diagonal, the elements on diagonal we'd like to maximize. And on the other hand, the elements that are off the diagonal, they're called in-batch negatives, we'd like to minimize them. So for instance, here, so the sentence, I want to fly to Prague, and Pra Sparta Prague is the best, they should not be similar. So I would like to minimize these similarities. How to do that? Well, I can take a softmax for every single row, convert these similarities into probabilities. So right now, for instance, here I have a probability of 52% that I want to fly to Prague. It's most similar to I would like to travel to Prague by plane. I'll take a cross entropy with the labels uh, being the diagonal, and that becomes my loss. And because this multiple negative symmetric ranking loss is symmetric, I'll also take the transpose of the matrix, compute the whole thing, and then that will become our loss. We don't have to do it. Someone has done it for us already. Uh, sentence MPNet was pre-trained with 1 billion training pairs, huge amount of data. So we can just use it. So with sentence transformers, we'll just actually just plug this name of the, the MPNet to into our code, and we are good to go. 
Now, let's work out this example one more time. Finally, suddenly here you see that these uh, sentences, these similarities, they start to make sense. So I want to fly to Prague, and I, the synonymous sentence, I would like to travel to Prague by plane, they finally have the highest cosine similarity, and then comes the rest. So again, this is just for intuition, but generally, sentence transformers, sentence snippings, they're suitable for representing sentences, short text, and dialogues just like we have. Cool, so let's use the sentence mpnet, extract the embeddings, train the logistic regression, and run the evolution. What do we get? Nice, this is good. Well, we got an improvement from 59 to 74% in terms of F1 score. This is a good start, but we'd like to do better. Let's train the sentence mpnet. Uh, how can we do that? Well, we can follow the pattern that I just introduced with multiple negative symmetric ranking loss. So what do we need for, to, to train the model? We need pairs of semantically similar text. So do we have that? If you, if you look at the dialogue, could you think for yourself which parts of the dialogue are semantically related? So which, how can we create these training pairs? What parts of the dialogues do you see it? If you think about it, the consecutive turns, they should be related because one is reaction to the other. It's like the question and answer pair. So, hey, I'm George, is related to hello, how shall I help you? Because it follows, it's part of the conversation. And then hello, how shall I help you? Should be related to I want to fly to Prague, da -di da -di da and that should be related to the next one, and next one, and next one. And if you'll be training the model like this with all the conversation, actually, what we are doing, we are defining our own function of similarity. And I find that cool. I hope you do. Uh, well, in terms of code, it's again just a few lines of code. You call it model.fit. You provide the, well, provide the data. I'm not showing you how to prepare data. I think you can handle it yourself. You say that you'd like to use this loss function if you define, and you are good. By the way, a disclaimer, since a month ago, uh, there was a new major release of Sentence Transformer, and this is currently a deprecated way how to train the model. It still works, but I didn't manage to uh, run this on my laptop, the, the new one, so just for you to know. It still works. Cool, so now we've trained our sentence and with our custom data. So again, let's extract the representation, let's train the logistic regression, let's run the evaluation, and what do we see? Voila, we get an F1 score of 92%. So from 74 to 92, and we didn't need any single example of label data. Everything we needed was just these dialogues, that's it. No one needed to label data. Fantastic. But let's come back to our example. Well, if you look into it, we're sort of back where we started. Finally, I, the sentence, I want to fly to Prague, is most similar to the sentence with the opposite meaning. I don't want to fly to Prague. Well, is it really a problem? Or is it really expected? If you think about it, these similarities, well, they don't, it kind of like makes sense because we were training our model, we said the similar things are the consecutive turns. So probably doesn't never happen in the conversation that George as the customer would say, I want to fly to Prague, and Ben would say, yeah, I would like to fly to Prague by plane. This is not happening. Ben would say like, when do you want to fly? How much do you want to pay? Where do you, et cetera. So it shouldn't be really surprising, and you should be aware of this. So in our use case, works fine, but there could be other use cases that this uh, would not be desired. Cool, so let's go to my favorite part, and that's uh, intuition. So right now I added here the percentage with which, or probability, with which the model thinks that this is a booking conversation, and this is, this is a real number, so why? Why 27%? What parts of the conversation are making our pipeline think that this is, a problem, this is a booking conversation with 27%. Well, for that, we can use SHAP library. So what SHAP does, I'm not sure if you're familiar, it actually hides certain parts of the input. So for instance, let's hide the word booked, and then the SHAP would run the full pipeline and then observe the new probability without this word booked. And again, these are real numbers, so if you would hide the word booked, suddenly our probability that this is a booking conversation would drop to 26% which would mean the word booked positively contributes towards the prediction of booking status. And we can actually let SHAP do its work and work out it for the whole, whole conversation. So this is how it looks. 
So first, the, there are the words in the red. Those are the words based on which the model thinks that this is a booking conversation. So here we have the word booked. It's the brightest, so it has the largest contribution. Like, my view, that's good. Ticket is booked. OK, that's, should, that should contribute towards booking conversation. But there are also a lot of irrelevant things, at least in my view, like 1010, B, and, sure, I, make, whatever. And then there are part words that are in blue based on which the model thinks this is not a booking conversation. So overall, in fact, like the model did a right prediction. So this was the, pro this was the, um, the, uh, the booking uh, action had the highest probability, but still was very low. And you can think that like if you might make small change in the text, the, mo the model can make the mistake and uh, you can confuse it and it can predict, predict different status, sorry, action. So why is this happening? Why our pipeline is using like these particular words mainly and not others? Well, we've never told our model how a booking conversation look like. So how to fix it? Well, first idea that you might have, you could do end-to-end -end training. So you can just train the sentence transformer and logistic regression together. You're good to go. Or maybe not, because you have just 10 dialogues per action. So yeah, you're very likely to overfit. This might not be a good idea. Better idea would be, better to, would be to go back to the realm of sentence transformers. So what do we need to train a sentence transformer? Well, we need pairs of semantically related or similar text. So do we have that if we use our labeled data? In fact, we do. If you, if you think about it, you can just create pairs of different conversations that have the same status. So you can take conversation with booking, the first conversation with booking, second one, and say, these, they talk about the same thing, they should be similar. And then you can do the same thing, but across different statuses, you can say, this is a booking conversation number one, and this is a conversation about no flight, whatever, and that these should be dissimilar. And like that, we can create 225 uh, similar pairs and up till 1,000 dissimilar pairs, much better. Cool. Then we can use contrastive loss, which is a standard loss that's being used in, uh, in training sentence transformers. We can pass these two conversations into the model. We can extract the, the embeddings for each conversation. Then we can calculate well, cosine distance, so one minus cosine, cosine distance. And if you would square this result, then essentially this would become our loss based on which we could tweak our sentence transformer uh, to understand that these two conversations are the same, should be the same, should be similar. Cool. Uh, in terms of code, again, one line of change. You just change the loss, prepare the data, you're good. Then, uh, once we have our model trained, we would get from, this is what we had before, that was the model was trained on unlabeled data, and we would get to this. So, first thing, notice that our prediction probability rose from 27 to 77%. Our model is much more confident that this is a booking conversation. And secondly, notice that the model is using only, in my view, relevant parts of the conversation. So it's using here, the ticket is booked. That's, that's here, it's okay, I don't know, could be some pattern, random noise, mistake, I don't know. But primarily, the picture that you're looking on the right looks much better on the left. Nice. So let's again do the same. They do the same routine. Let's plug it to our pipeline, extract the embedding, strain the logistic regression, run the evaluation, and we see we get an improvement of an, an, another four percent improvement. Yeah, our F1 score rose to ninety-six percent. So you say, okay, four percent improvement. That's not much. But in fact, you got much more than that. Because if you will look at the prediction probabilities of the previous model, so this, uh, these are the prediction probabilities of the sentence MPNet that was trained on unlabeled data, you can see that typically it's around 30%. So the model is really not sure about its own prediction. And as I said, if you would tweak the initial the, the dialogue, if the person would say, I don't know, some random stuff, then the model could change its prediction. So this, this is like, this is, you don't want that. Like, you would really have unstable, uh, unstable predictions. However, if you would do the same thing for, if you would plot this same graph for the model that was trained also with labeled data, we see that our model is much more confident. The predictions are around 70 or 80%. And this is also reflected into the better separation of the space. So 
Now on these graphs, you are looking at uh, embeddings projected with PCA into two dimensions. On the left, you see the sentence MPNet just trained on unlabeled data. On the right, you see the sentence MPNet trained on unlabeled and then labeled data. And you can see that the one on the right has much better separation across different classes. Yeah? So every single point is a conversation, and every different color represents different actions. So this, the, this picture looks much better than here. You see how these are overlapping. And if you are looking closely, and by the way, this is generally good practice, like view, look at your data, view your data. I'm not sure if you can see, but here there are two points. This is no reservation in the middle of the cluster with no flights. What's that? Why is that? Like, this is a good question. Like, wh why, why did we get it? Why our model thinks that? In fact, I deliberately left some uh, incorrectly labeled data in the data set. So this was an uh, open data set that I took online. Some labels are incorrect, and they are marked. So I deliberately left them there, because this is what's happening in practice. You cannot really trust your labels. So if you would remove these incorrectly labeled data just from the validation set, you can keep them in the training. Suddenly, your F1 score would rise to 99%. And that's something which we would make the Python Air happy. Cool. So uh, just one last slide from my side, take away. So uh, if you're working on machine learning problems, and it doesn't have to be just this one, my takeaway is try to work out, try to come up with the right representation for your data. It will make your life easy. And remember, representation is king. That's it for me. I'm happy to have a chat as I used, I finished again so much earlier than I expected. Classic. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adam, for your presentation. Please, if you have a question, go to the first mic, please. Hello. Hey. Test, 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 yeah. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, this is um, yeah, the last improvement, just being like 4% in the F1 score. Uh -huh. I thought it might be related to F1 score because I noticed that what is a good F1 score depends on if it's a balanced uh, mm -hmm. binary thing or not. So, yeah, I think I changed to using Matthew's correlation coefficient, if you know that. That's like, it's more normalized, and maybe if you just use that, it it's shows better how, how big uh -huh. improvement this last step okay, is. Okay, thanks for a tip. I, I don't know it. I'll, like, maybe I also can invite you to look into the uh, GitHub. There is code. You can look at the precision and recalls there. So maybe then, then we can see like what's going on. But uh, I will find you after the lecture and <laughs> one more time make note of this, uh, this measure. Okay, Thanks. But yeah, really, really great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Um, oh no, I, I Sorry. Um, I don't know how this works. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was just curious. So, let's say we take an open model, right? It was trained on Wikipedia articles, and that's very well written text, no typos, nothing. And now we want to use it for dialogue, for text of people that type. Maybe they have typos, maybe they are not really native, native speakers. Mm -hmm. Now, and the problem that we are facing is that the tokenizer even may not be very adequate for the task. Mm -hmm. And now, now we face the issue of retraining the tokenizer, which means that we'll have to maybe retrain the whole model from scratch. So how would you address this problem? Well, I think the best thing would be to find the guy who spoke about exactly this problem yesterday. <laughs> uh, there was a talk in the other hall. Um, I forgot the name. And he exactly spoke about the same thing. So I would refer you to that. I have to say that this data set was error dialog. Maybe, maybe you are familiar with it. It's open source dialog. There are no typos, no problems. Uh, in our company, we do this, do these things on, in practice. And yeah, the conversation looks completely different. They're messy. It's never happening that, like you, like, you never have like this customer says something, agent says something. It's like customer says five things, and agent then starts slowly replying while the agent is, you have hyperlinks, images, this is much more complicated in practice. So I uh, maybe would invite you to, to ask the other guy. I, I think that would be better than, than me doing this. OK, thank you. Hi, very cool talk. Uh, I was wondering, do you have any idea how does the batch size affect uh, the training loss and consequently the convergence and the end, end performance? Uh, good question. Uh, so these are the air dialogues. They're very short dialogues, just a few turns. 
I don't have it in my head how, how long, but generally short. Uh, in practice, we work with much longer text, and again, this is, becomes much, uh, like much, pr much more problematic. So my suggestion for that would be use more uh, advanced sentence transformers, just larger sentence transformers that can first of all take more context, but in general they are just smarter. And uh, I forgot the name. Uh, I can look it up for you. I was looking in, like as you saw these graphs. I, so I did uh, these. I worked out with these graphs. One was sentence transformer, and one I just used a different model. For this problem, it doesn't matter. It's not a complicated problem. But if you would use the like the data and practical data, then uh, that could be the way how to tackle that. Just use a better sentence transformer. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so you've shown this sort of detour when you went to the sentence transformers and then fine-tuned it and you basically went back to having like similar causa and similarities than mm -hmm. before. So I wonder what happens if you leave out the sentence transformer and just fine-tune the token-based model directly. Did you try that out? Do you get like the same uh, quality of results in the end? How would you fine-tune it? How will I? Well, couldn't you do the same procedure, right? You take your chats again, uh, like you've done with the sentence model, and oh, yeah. then train it, but use the token-based model as, as the basis for your fine-tuning. Of course. Ideas. Yeah, sure. The, the, like, nothing stops you from doing it. It's just this, uh, if you go back, uh, like here, like maybe here, just, yeah, I don't know where it was. Or, yeah, whatever. Let, let, me, let me find it. Of course, you can, st like, you're just be picking up, like, better starting point. Your sentence. Uh, my question is, uh, have you tried it out? Um, I'm wondering whether the sentence transform actually improves things or whether you end up more or less in the same place. Uh, I think, so note that the sentence transformer, this sentence MP was trained on 1 billion training pairs. Right. We had 15,000 conversations of right. which we created 180,000 pairs. So I haven't tried it out, but I'm quite confident that you would not get the same results because right. you would just need much more data. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you, Adam, for your Pleasure. presentation. Thank you. Thanks.